Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 4 of the Utopia Cast. I am your host, Eric Hogan, and today I am not joined by my co-host, Michael Beaupre, um, or my newly minted co-host, Elliot Vajnitsa, as one is on vacation and the other is attending graduation ceremonies, and uh, so it's just me for today. So I'm going to be holding down the fort. And uh, so for today, I figured I think this is no better time than now to uh, kind of talk about some things that are fairly personal for me, and that might seem a little bit weird as, of course, I'm releasing this to the public, but um, that's for two reasons. The The main reason would be, um, you know, if other people are dealing with stuff like this, it would be an honor to, um, you know, be a beacon of, you know, you're not alone. And uh, the second thing is it will definitely be a cathartic experience for me because some of this information is the first time I've ever kind of talked about it. And uh, yeah, so just a forewarning for people and there's going to be a few warnings uh, throughout here. Um, you know, if you're sensitive to things like mental health and depression and, um, you know, general battles with um, mental and, um, you know, emotional things. Um, it's probably not the podcast for you, but if you are, um, you know, okay with listening to that stuff, it would be an honor for you guys to listen to uh, some of the stuff that I have dealt with throughout um, my young life. Um, you know, I haven't lived a ton of life, but um, I would like to think that some things that I've gone through may be relatable to others out there, and especially my uh, my strength athletes who are who are listening to this and uh, feel like they have to um, maybe live up to the persona of being a strength athlete. So uh, without further ado, this is something that I've prepared and been sitting on for quite a while now, and it's called Sport That Saved Me. It was Sport That Saved Me. It was 2016. Summer had started. Life was changing, but I was on top of the world. A valedictorian award here, a most outstanding athlete award there. Eric Hogan, he could do it all. Whether it was football, my most natural sport, basketball, my most intense, or track and field, my most god-gifted, or in the classroom, where I, I always excelled. But it was not all sunshine and rainbows. I learned the hard way that when you are successful in spite of other shortcomings, that is used against you, and you are made to feel guilty. I can say with true honesty I was never really able to enjoy my accomplishments before the age of 18, as every step of the way, there was someone or something that did not want me to. Grown adults criticizing my every move, waiting for the day I would slip, waiting for the day they could justify why I was not deserving of everything I had earned. That day never came, because I was hyper-vigilant of this from the jump. I've always said, I do not feel bad for me today, but my heart breaks for the 15-18 to 18 year old kid who could not allow himself to experience joy without having to strongly consider, am I coming off as too arrogant? Be humble. This is not a big deal. However, in many ways, I was untouchable. My personal growth was stunted that summer shortly after, a period in which I personally believe I spiraled into a two-year descent into madness that... I cannot dis quite describe with words, but I will try. I gained and lost everything with, in what seemed like weeks, but the stubbornness I was born with forced me to turn a blind eye to what was happening around me. I was moving on. I was off to bigger and better. Or so I thought. The summer days went by. I grew more and more anxious as the time passed. I was off to college soon. The big fish in the small pond was now entering the ocean. And there were no channels, or streams, or tributaries to help indoctrinate me into the unknown. I wanted to feel excited, I really did, but I just couldn't. I loathed the thought of trying to open up to a new set of people. I even loathed the thought of being so far away, with no reliable way to get back. I just did not want to go. You see, when you're good at a lot of things, you are usually not great at one. And that was my downfall. The jack of all trades, the master of none, in a world that rewards specialists but preaches how being well-rounded is a good thing. Play basketball, they said. Well, my experience was soured my final year, and it was a bit of a pipe dream walking on as a five foot four, nineteen year old. Play football then. Well, again, it's not as easy as that. At that level your size matters more than anything, and I wasn't recruited, an uphill battle I did not deem worth it. Well, why don't you just do track? I guess. It was the sport I had the least passion for, but why not give it a whirl? I'm an athlete and I'm fast. Um perfect match made in heaven. I spent most of that summer cross-training, and for the first time ever, I lifted heavy, and I lifted for strength. I enjoyed it. The euphoric rush was what I looked forward to every day, and I could not get enough of it. I had this in my back pocket. College was everything I did not want it to be. Extremely overwhelming, filled with false promises, and having to start over when in reality I was secure with where I was before. Yes, I respect your icebreaker game, but I do not want to play it. 
I cringed at the thought of forced social interaction without meaning. Indoor track, a sport I had never done, was on the come up. I was not excited for practices at all. I was the odd person out. Again, forced to start new at the bottom of the totem pole as I was not a recruited or prioritized contributor to the team. I found myself looking forward to two days of the week and two days of the week only, our strength days in the weight room. I was frustrated as I was spending so much time to something I was not passionate about, and on top of that, I was getting no tangible results. Remember how I said I'm stubborn? Well, this lasted for a good four months as I slowly lost myself. I don't know if it would be appropriate to say I was becoming a recluse, especially going off of the pure dictionary definition, but I certainly could not muster up the courage to even speak anymore. I had nothing to say, no opinions. Finally, I told myself, this is it. After meet number one, if you do not feel that rush, you are, embrace yourself, leaving the team. Or, as some people so effortlessly call it, quitting. The meet came, I did not enjoy a single second of it. That was a Saturday. I sat on the idea on Sunday. By Monday, I informed the coach that I was no longer going to be participating in the sport. I told my parents that Sunday, and for the first time in my life, I felt like a failure. Eric Hogan, the athlete of the year, was now just a regular college student. Was this my destiny? Was this how it was supposed to go for me? Again, back to the stubbornness, I wasn't going to accept that as my end, and if it were to end, it would be doing something I enjoyed and at least experienced positivity with. When I mentioned I lost myself, and forewarning this is not the easiest thing for me to talk about, I quite literally felt as if I was a placeholder for my own body. The spirit was gone. I am not ashamed to admit that during this time, I was depressed. I was hurt emotionally, and I did not know what to do. The dangers of framing your identity around a single entity are very pronounced when that entity is stripped away from you. Worst of all, I was feeling like those grown adults that used to prey on my downfall were right all along, and that I was simply a product of my environment. I was just like everyone else. Maybe I did just get preferential treatment. I was spending a lot of time alone at this time, time that I needed after spending about a good two years giving myself to others. I cried a decent amount around this time, and sometimes I didn't know why. This was before it was socially acceptable, at least for males, and I don't think I told anyone about this. Eric Hogan, you are a failure. You are not who you think you are. It is time to come back to reality, and you're just like the rest of us. The following will sound pretty cliche, and I am hyper aware of that, but this is just who I am and how I feel in a visceral sense, so bear with me. In my depressive state, I kept coming across an album cover on YouTube. It was purple, with a silver metal ball in the center, ripping through what looked like sound waves. Currents by Tim and Paula. I figured, hey, I keep seeing this everywhere. Why don't I see what it's all about, as I read reviews online that it was an 8 to 9 out of 10. What happened next quite literally changed my life. Track number one, Let It Happen started. It was over seven minutes long. Quite aggressive, I thought. Over the span of those seven minutes, I had an experience like no other. It was introspective. It was euphoric. It was bad. It was real. Listening to the words, I felt like my life was being described by someone else. The ups, the downs, the ebbs, and the flows. Almost as if someone was watching from a third party. Oh, maybe I was ready all along. A line that hit me like a freight train. Maybe I was ready for a change well before all of this had happened, and I was just too much in my own way to see it. I had uncovered what was holding me down for so long. After the song ended, I had to take a couple minutes to decompress. Again, I cried. But this felt like a cathartic experience. Like a, I need to get this out of me so I can actually move on. And that was honestly the effect it had. Track number 13, New Person, Same Old Mistakes, solidified my feelings on life at the time. I can just hear them now. How could you let us down? But they don't know what I found or see it from this way around. Another line. A realization is as good as a guess, and I know it seems wrong to accept. I've learned that most things in life are not as deep as we want them to be. They just are. And realizing the truth sometimes is just as good as a guess, or at worst, has the same effect. Perception, in many ways, is reality. From that moment on, I made a vow to myself that I would never look at myself in that manner I did for those four months ever again. However, full disclosure, this is something I constantly still deal with, but I've gotten better with it. I've learned it's called imposter syndrome, and it probably will be with me for the rest of my life. Enter the barbell. You came into my life when I was at my most vulnerable, the most impressionable. You were, for lack of a better comparison, solid when I was malleable. 
You represented progression, and I represented it regression and stagnation. I was humbled by you. I was afflicted from the beginning. As patient as I was, you tested me. Was this worth it? Was this worth the independent commitment that I had to push everything else to the side for? How would I explain to the people in my life that the sport I do is what people do as a recreational hobby? Did I owe anyone an explanation, however? To me, the answer was quite clear. If I was going to do something athletically this go-around, it had to be for me, for my own pride. I remember as the semester closed, I restructured my entire life around you. I could not get enough. A few times a week, I would even train twice a day. However, you showed me, and later instilled in me, that more is not necessarily better, and there is merit in the minimum effective dose. I remember class was at 8am. I was up at 5.30am for you. I remember taking pre-workout powder at 6pm, laying in bed wide awake at 2am, because of you. Then, I got the first blow to my ego. As passionate as I was, sometimes if that passion does not align with people's construct, you are looked at as taking it too serious. I remember telling people, and in particular, someone close to me, as a matter of fact, that I could not talk at the moment as I was training from 4 to 6 p.m. I blocked off the time for my own sanity. You go to the gym and work out. There's nothing stopping you from talking to me. And I paused, and I replayed that first sentence in my mind several times. And then it dawned on me. This person was right. I do go to the gym and work out. It is true. There's nothing stopping me from doing anything else in that time frame or taking it as serious as I am. However, this period really taught me that this self-imposed structure is what separates me from the rest. That is one of my gifts I was blessed with. It also hit me that not everyone is going to understand this phase of my life. However, they don't need to. 2016, you showed me that change is inevitable. The change is initially met with pushback 9 times out of 10. You also taught me that there was more to life to live, and what defined me from age 10 to 18 does not define the rest of my life. However, I would be remiss to say that I did not relapse several times over the course of the next two years. 2017, as much joy as it initially provided me, started to become jaded as the honeymoon phase had ended. A nagging injury there, stalled progress there. I had contemplated heavily, okay, Maybe pursuing this for performance is not necessary. Why am I beating myself up for literally no payoff? I had to be objective for the first time in a while since I was my own coach. I did not have people telling me what I was doing was too aggressive for my current level. I didn't have people telling me that I needed to start fresh and it honestly never even dawned on me that I should take a rest day, a few times a week even, and it would not stall my progress and in fact probably make me progress even more. You see, I was really trading one vice for another. I made this whole claim on how and why wrapping your identity around one single entity is very dangerous, and here I am doing exactly that just with something else. Now, what I'm about to say might be a bit jarring, so again, forewarning. People who are successful in life do not lead balanced lives. People who are not successful typically preach a balanced approach to work and play, but there's a disconnect in this concept in my opinion. When you are so balanced, you end up how I was, kind of okay at everything, but not good at any one thing. Remember when I said this world rewards specialists? You can see now what my thinking was at the time. Go full force until you cannot anymore into one discipline. However, think about how I phrased my notion. People who are successful do not lead balanced lives. I did not say successful people are 100% locked in and 24, you know, always locked in 24-7. Mathematically, Balance in the scenario is 50-50. I think I was trending 85-15 work to le leisure ratio, and it was simply not sustainable. Again, I had to be objective in that if I wanted to continue with this, I must bring that balance closer to 50-50 while keeping the goal the goal. This was the snowball effect I needed, and it really helped me sustain myself. I reduced the number of times I trained a week, and I even reduced my workouts in terms of time spent in the gym. When and behold, I started to make progress again, and I felt like a human, and I wasn't in constant pain. I think those days of me hyper-pushing myself was my subconscious way of punishing myself for failure in my other avenues. I wasn't over it yet. Me projecting, oh yeah? Well, watch how hard I can go with no one guiding me. Stupid, I know. But I think now that I'm years removed, I can say this for close to 100% certainty. The other realization I came to at this time was I was an introvert. I think people who knew me before college 
maybe not the people closest to me, but the people who were around me often would say I was an extrovert. That is because I felt comfortable. They did not remember the six to 10 years of elementary and middle school where I was the lowest on the totem pole. I leaned into this a bit too hard, I think, at first, but I am happy I did because overall it was the best thing for my mental clarity in a time that was ever changing. I made the choice to move into a single dorm, a double-edged sword as I was alone. I was also able to be alone with my thoughts. Again, this is the first time I think I've said this out loud, so forewarning. For the second half of my sophomore year of college, and for the entirety of my junior year, I had just about every single meal in my room, alone, and I spent every second I was not in the gym or in class in that tiny five paces forward, at least forward and back, maximum, room. Yes, that means I avoided the dining hall like the plague, I avoided the student union, I avoided any place that had a high density of people. I started to come back home more often. At one point I was traveling the six total hours back and forth to Maine once a week just to feel like I belonged. Those days, much like my initial depressive wave, were not as dark as I was not as down and flat as I was in years prior, but I literally started to become paranoid. Someone I did not know well would try to talk to me. Paranoia that manifested as a mental hell and quickly turned into a phobia. Everywhere I went, I would have both headphones in, music up loud enough to block out what was going on around me. In case someone said my name, I could default to that. I would walk with my head down, projecting body language that I did not want to be spoken to. Many times it worked. Other times it would be quite annoying when people did not pick up on what I thought was a fairly obvious social cue. Time, I have learned, heals all. I was patient with this, and it did get better. I still don't like crowds of people who I am not unfamiliar with, unfamiliar with rather. I still like to spend a ton of time alone, but that paranoia aspect is gone. It is just an inconvenience for me at this point. So if I ever come off as dismissive and or aloof, this is probably the reason. Now all this time has gone by and I haven't even told you the sport I was channeling myself into. Well, that was Olympic style weightlifting, which is the thatch and the clean and jerk. I was in love with the sport because it blended power, strength, and athleticism. It wasn't just brute strength, there was a component of flexibility and mobility, and there was a component of pure force. However, I spun my wheels for about a year and a half, and I did make decent progress. However, a few weightlifting meets, I realized that I was strong, pretty strong in fact, but I was never mobile enough or nearly as technical to progress myself into the weights that would be national caliber. Then it hit me, there is a sport out there where you can still execute technique, be strong, and look like an athlete. Enter the sport that truly saved me powerlifting, in particular, the raw, drug-tested side of powerlifting. There was a whole world out there that was tailor-made for me. These people trained hard, they were fairly intellectual about their approaches, and they promoted a drug-free option to strength sport. To be frank, I was more strong than I was mobile and precise. At first, I was obsessed. I wanted to, again, go as hard as I possibly could as I was progressing very fast, faster than what was sustainable. That was 2018. Things were different back then. At this stage, my generation probably sees life as pre-coronavirus and post-coronavirus. 2018, the world was a bit more at bay, and we were not as fearful about concepts around us. But maybe we were, and I was just oblivious. Summer of 2018 was one for the ages. I worked for eight hours in the sun, pretty much every day. I would train for two to three hours a night, I would go to sleep, and I would do it all again the next day. In many ways, I am trying to get back to that time, as things were streamlined and regimented, something I learned I personally crave, whether I want to actually admit it or not. My progress in competition was unlike any sporting endeavor I had had. Most sports I played, I had to take my lumps in the beginning. In football, I did not touch the ball until a full year after I started playing. In basketball, I was probably the worst player on the team for three to four years. In track, although I did have natural talent, I lost my first race quite convincingly. This was different. In my first meet, I qualified for nationals in the open and junior division, and I shattered four state records. 2018 came and went. 2019 was here, and it was much of the same. However, that honeymoon phase with this sport was now over, and then came my first setback, my first big injury. You see, as a younger kid, you take having a healthy body for granted. Only when you get hurt and the thing you look forward to most starts to become tear-inducing painful, you understand why it's not something to take lightly. Needless to say, however, I made it through to the other side. 2019 came and went, 
and 2020 was here, the start of a new decade, where I honestly felt the most optimistic in quite some time. During this time, I committed to doing my first national level meet, which is Collegiate Nationals. I was to be the first athlete from my school to ever do this meet, and I had potential to medal in the top five. Then, the world was put on pause. Coronavirus restrictions blockaded me from doing this meet, and then I entered what was the second real turning point in my life. Gyms closed, I was really at a loss for how I would maintain my strength, as inevitably, it would come a time when gyms opened back up and meets were happening again. I decided to do what I think most people wouldn't. I invested around $2,000, my own money, into a full set of kilo plates, a new bar, a cheap pair of squat stands, and a bench I was able to scavenge from a friend. For pretty much a full year after that, all of my training sessions were outside on my porch. Those days were trying times. Sure, on Instagram, it looked quite comical, but I would get home from working eight hours of manual labor. I would lug every set of plates that I had outside, set up each stand, make sure it was anchored down, and only then could I begin the session. Then I would have to reverse that process. It would turn into what would normally be a two-hour workout into sometimes a three to three and a half hour session every time. There were many days where I questioned if it was worth it, and to be honest, sometimes the answer was no. However, I would be damned if I did not make substantial progress during that time. As 2020 bled into 2021, it was starting to get colder, and I was then forced to train in my bedroom, which, for all intents and purposes, fits maybe two people in it. I even invested into a full power rack for this. However, this is where that turning point came. The way my room was configured, I found out months later after the fact that I was on a slant this entire time, and in turn, I was putting substantially more pressure onto one side of my body than the other. This is easily the worst injury I have had in powerlifting to date, and to boot, Nationals 2021 was in line as they were honoring people who were blocked from last year's cancelled event, so I was prepping for a national meet, injured, in my bedroom, where I slept, ate meals, engaged in watching TV shows, and stuff of the like. Squatting 135 pounds was well under my max painful in my left knee to the point that I had to take 2-3 to three ibuprofen before any squat or deadlift workout, and I had to do isometrics up to 3 times a day just to get a numbing sensation in the tendon. Traveling to that meet was a nightmare. The elevation coupled with being cramped in the seat for hours caused the knee to deteriorate, so much so that the morning of the meet, I quite literally was doubting if I could even hit what I declared as an opener. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, I was here. Time to get after it. That meet came and went. I did win a medal. It should have been an accomplishment, but I felt pretty defeated. No PR squat, no PR deadlift, and no PR total. 7 for 9 day. I had never done worse than 8 for 9 before that point. As embarrassing as it sounds, I felt like a failure here, again. The pinnacle of the sport, and I did not execute. Maybe I was not the lifter I thought I was. I spent the next 14, and yes, that is absolutely 100% accurate, 14 weeks rehabbing the knee to the point where I was confident again, and I'm happy to say I had the comeback meet of the ages in New Hampshire, a 9 for 9 day PRs on everything, and that has only progressed since then as I chip away at each milestone one at a time. Lastly, I would be remiss to say powerlifting gave me a chance to help others as I started to coach people around the end of 2017. I always knew I wanted to coach and help people in some capacity, and this gave me the outlet to do so, and with that came an opportunity to have a legitimate source of income coupled with a passion, something I have never taken for granted, as my team has grown from three members in 2019 to close to 40 in 2022. To the sport that saved me, you gave me things in life that I will carry on forever, and for that, I thank you. At my lowest, you were there to keep me sane. At my highest, you were the reason. In between, you were there too. You gave me relationships that will last a lifetime. You helped an introvert come out of his shell. You provided a place of comfort where there wasn't any. Where I go, you go. Where I stay, you stay. Life, as I've learned, is quite dynamic, but we find solace in stability. My own private oasis, my own utopia. We're four years strong, and life has changed for the better because of you. And for that, I am forever indebted to your power. From here to eternity, Eric Miles Hogan.